The terminology the sons of God is for both men and women in Christ Jesus. Uh, the reason that, that uh, we are called the sons of God, uh, sonship has to do with inheritance. And in the Old Testament context, the, 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 the daughter never got the inheritance. Mm. Inheritance only ever went to the sons, and the eldest son got a double portion. A double portion of the whole inheritance. And so, in the New Testament, when it says that we are the sons of God, men and women in Christ Jesus are the sons of God. The New Testament is saying in Christ Jesus there's no difference between a man and a woman in regards to our relationship with God. And in relationship to the inheritance that we can receive from God. Yes, we know there is a difference between men and women in the natural. Okay? The plumbing is different. Okay? Thank you. And, and, and there are men and women differences. But what we're talking about in regards to inheritance, that we're all heirs of God the Father through Christ Jesus. And so, uh, just as we're going to we'll look next weekend at the, the bride and the bridegroom paradigm... And uh, we are the bride of Christ. Men and women, we are the bride of Christ. However, uh, I am not the bride of Christ. You are not the bride of Christ individually. We are. Yes. The sons of God is dealing with who we are in our relationship with God the Father. It's our, our individual relationship with God the Father. That's the emphasis. Uh, the, the, being the bride of Christ is now who we are corporately. That's very important revelation. It's not just me and Jesus, who we are corporately in our relationship to Jesus. However, with the, the, the bride, uh, bridal paradigm, there, there is revelation in regards to how we personally would relate to him as well. But that's next weekend. We've got a whole weekend conference. The bride and the bridegroom overcoming in the end times through intimacy is the key. Um, but a lot of this has got to do with identity. And if, you, if you're working in the arena of, of counseling, um, the biggest problem, that the root of most people's problem, apart, yes, we can say the root is sin. The root is sin, and the father of lies has lied to you about who God is. And the father of lies has lied to you about who you are, who you've been born to be. So your identity is in something else. It's in a lie of the enemy. Uh, your identity is um, outside of who God has created you to be. So when we understand that we've been born again to be the sons of God, it's realigning our understanding of who am I, my identity. And my identity ultimately is who I am in Christ Jesus. Because my relationship with God the Father, who I am in Christ Jesus, who is the Son of God, that will determine who I am in relationship to the Father. And, uh, and, and, and the reason why people struggle with all sorts of emotional problems and all sorts of confusion in life is that you don't know who God created you to be. And the enemy's come in, even since you're a little child, and he's been lying to you. He's been trying to give you another identity. And when you pursue that other identity, there's something of you that, that, that rips. And you're, you're trying to be something that you are not. So the Son of God revelation is incredibly important. Because um, when we know who Jesus is as the Son of God then we become more and more like Him, and that's how we get revealed as the sons of God. Because we've all been born again to be the sons of God. However, we're not all yet shining forth the glory of Jesus, the Son of God. So over the next couple of weeks, on Sunday morning, I'm going to be pursuing the subject of being revealed as the sons of God. What does it mean to be the sons of God? This is a huge subject in the New Testament. This is one of the... Because every time it talks about Jesus, the Son of God, it's talking about who God has created you to be. Because you're created to be a son of God. And the more you become like Jesus, the more you become the person God created you to be. This is a very important subject. But let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. 
Therefore, brothers, we'll start with verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. We have a responsibility. We have a God-given mandate. That's what it's saying here. We have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. It'll be emotional death. It'll be spiritual death. It'll be death of your, the identity of who God created you to be. If you're going to live to fulfill your sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit, if you live to fulfill the desires of the Spirit, you will put to death the misdeeds of the body and you will live. If you're really living to fulfill the desires of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father, He is the Spirit of Christ Jesus, they're one and the same. If you're, if you're going to live to fulfill the, the heart cry of God the Father, you will start to put to death the works of the flesh. You will put to death the works of sin, so that you can live. It goes on. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. There are two natures. There's the nature of the Spirit. That is the Spirit of God who now comes into us when we get born again. You get born again of the Spirit of God. And when you're born again of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. And your spirit is born again unto God. Your spirit was existing before that, but it was not alive to God. And when your spirit is born again in relationship to God, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. And then the Holy Spirit starts to work. But there is a, a confrontation. There is a, a, a wrestling match that's, that takes place from that point. It is between your flesh nature, that is your fallen human sinful nature, who you are in the flesh, and who you are now in God's spirit. The new creation part of you, the new creation part of you has been born again to be a son of God, to be, uh, to be changed and transformed into the image of the son of God. However, the flesh nature constantly resists that process. And so this is what we're starting with. If you are someone that allows yourself to be led by the spirit of God and you're not being led by the flesh, you're not listening to the voice of your carnal, fleshly, sinful nature, but you're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. In other words, they're the ones that get revealed as the sons of God. And we'll look at this in more detail. But when you're born again of the Spirit of God, you are born again to be a son of God, but you're not yet revealed as a son of God. Just like a baby of a king that is born, when you look at that baby, you don't see the glorious king that will inherit the throne in the future. You just see a baby. That's what it's like when we get born again. Immature. We've got to go through a process of maturity. We've got to grow up. And by the way, there's many men that grew up to the full age to receive the kingship, but because they never matured uh, in themselves, they were very bad kings in history. Um... But those that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the ones that will be increasingly being revealed. I want to I want to emphasize right now process. You don't just get born again and then the next day, boom, you're Jesus. You know. Uh, however, I know that when I got saved, the very night I got saved, I, I I couldn't speak two sentences without swearing. I was effing this, effing that, and and other words that I couldn't even hint to in church. I had the foulest mouth you could ever imagine. The day after I got saved, there was no swearing coming out of my mouth. It's like cleansed. Two years later, I was, I hammered, I was hammering something, smashed my thumb with a, a, a hammer, and, and a bad word came out of my mouth. It was the first time in two years. Mm. But I'm just saying that there was a dramatic change the night I got saved. Uh, I, I stopped taking drugs. I never took drugs ever again. Before that, I was taking drugs all the time. Instant sh there was an instant change. Um, people saw me a week later and they go, oh my goodness, what happened to you? That They saw a change. However, the, there was some big things that changed, like regularly getting drunk. I never got drunk ever again, you know. And, and there's some big changes that took place and not I got saved. But then there's a lot of little things that took years to work through. And I want to emphasize process and it's a revealing of the sons of God. It says, uh, 
You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Um, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on this in another teaching, uh, but today I just want to emphasize this. The Holy Spirit that we've received is the spirit of adoption or the spirit of sonship. And that spirit of sonship is, is, is one that will make us into the sons of God. And so the Holy Spirit within us, when we really receive the Holy Spirit, we, He starts to cry out from deep within our inner man. He's crying out, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Deep within you, there is something that knows, He is my Father, He is my Father. Now, deep woundedness, believing lies of the enemy about yourself, um, all of that is in our soul nature. You've got your body, your flesh and blood part of you. Then there's the soul. The soul is your mind, your emotions, and your conscience. Your mind, your emotions, and your conscience. And then the spirit is a part of you that gets born again. By the way, if you're not born again this morning, you might try to be a good person, but you don't have the inner power of God to help you change. And if you're not born again this morning, you can get born again before you have lunch. Okay? So even though you're born again, the soul realm can be full of all sorts of hurts and wounds and ungodly beliefs and demonic bondages and everything. And so what happens is, as the Spirit of God works deep within you, there's a pressure starts to break out. And this is a conflict now within you between the Spirit and the flesh. And, and, and this conflict, it will, it will hold down the Spirit of God in you. Those wounds, those ungodly beliefs. Um, that you, you hold to in your inner man. Um, but the Spirit of God's job is that He's now starting to put some pressure on the inside. And He's starting to push out. And if we're in agreement with Him and we cooperate with Him, then we start to change in our personalities, our, our soul, our mind, our thinking, our emotions start to change. Again, it's a process. And by the way, uh, when you start to change on the inside, people will start to see it on the outside. Did you know that 80% of all sickness is psychosomatic? 80% of the, our body's sickness has a root. It's emotional or mental. Because your mind, your, your emotions and your thinking is not in alignment with the truth of God. It's in alignment with the lies of the enemy. So we don't have a spirit that makes us a slave to fear... And again, that's what I want to really look at in more detail in another teaching, um, how we get set free from the spirit of fear. And if you have worry or anxiety or stress, there, another name for that is fear. If you study counselling, worry and anxiety is always coming to a fear-based issue within you. Mm -hmm. And fear comes from the fact that you don't know God as Father. That's right, yeah. If you don't know God as Father, you don't know who you are. Mm. The real you. The one that God created. You're always living a lie. And so we receive not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of sonship. By him we're able to start to cry out, Abba, Father. And by the way, whenever I see in the Bible, when the Bible tells me, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And if I'm not experiencing that work powerfully in my life, I start to pray with boldness in Jesus' name and say, Holy Spirit, almost commanding the Holy Spirit, because I'm commanding the Holy Spirit according to the will of the Father. I'm in agreement I'm commanding my spirit to listen to the Holy Spirit. That's what I do. My spirit, my soul, I command you, listen to the voice of the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, the Bible says that you are, you are the spirit of sonship and by you I will cry out, Abba, Father. And I don't feel like I'm crying out, Abba, Father this morning. I feel more like an orphan than a son. Uh, so Holy Spirit, I command you, rise up within me. My spirit, I command my spirit to rise up in agreement with the Holy Spirit. You've got to learn how to pray these prayers. Amen. How to set yourself free. Mm. How to command yourself out of the lie into the truth. Mm. And uh, it goes on. The Spirit Himself will testify with our spirit that we are God's children. So two things. He's revealing to us the Father. And there's a lot of scripture I could look at on this subject. The Holy Spirit comes to reveal Jesus who reveals the Father. And if I don't know God clearly, I can simply say, Holy Spirit, God has sent you to me. He has placed you within me to reveal to me Jesus mm -hmm. and to reveal to me God the Father. 
And I want to know more about him. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, I command you. I agree with you. I exhort you. Reveal to me the Father. Amen. But also reveal to me I am not an orphan. That's right, yeah. Reveal to me that I am a son of God. Amen. Because I don't feel like it today. So now start to reveal to me more of who I am in Christ Jesus. It says, now, if we are children, then we are heirs. If we are heirs of God, then we are co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. I just want to make one point here is, if we are really the sons of God, then we are... Heirs of God the Father. God, the, He's our Father. He has a, a heavenly glorious kingdom with heavenly glorious power and heavenly glorious uh, you know, blessings that are out there. And all of that is our inheritance. That's the Father's house. When we're the sons of God, we come into the Father's house. All that belongs to the Father belongs to us. That's what the, the Father said to the elder son in the story of the prodigal son. All that belongs to me belongs to you. It's, 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 it's your inheritance. All of my kingdom belongs to you. It's the orphan spirit that doesn't believe that. Mm. I'm not worthy. I can just be a slave. I'm the unworthy person. I'm the worm. You know, that's all orphan spirit thinking. Mm. The Son of God is all that belongs to you, Father, belongs to me. And so it says, if we are truly the sons of God, then we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Whatever God has promised to Jesus is actually a promise to us, the church. There's a whole other, I could go into a whole teaching, but when we went through the seven letters to the seven churches, I showed you some of the messianic promises of God the Father to Jesus, the Son of God. And then those same messianic promises, Jesus was saying, if we overcome, if we pass the test... All the promises of God the Father to Him are ours. It's a powerful concept. And again, the orphan spirit um, doesn't know the fullness of God. And it doesn't enter into a relationship with God the Father through Jesus. And therefore, it can't even believe in that. It's like, no, that, that can't be true. Um, by the way, it says... Um, if we're going to share in the, the glory, it says also we need to share in the sufferings. There is a process to being glorified as the sons of God. There is a process to being revealed as the sons of God. And that, and that process will involve suffering. What type of suffering? Ultimately, it's the suffering of you getting your flesh and crucifying your flesh on the cross. It's you, it's you getting your sinful desires and you get in those sinful desires and you take them to the altar and you put them to death. There is a suffering when you die to self. That's what it is. Because the self nature is the flesh nature, and it's not the Son of God nature within you. And there's a suffering when you, when you don't do what your flesh wants to do. Um, the resisting of sin itself, there's a suffering in the struggle, but I can guarantee to you when you put that sin to death, it says here, you will live. When we put the works of the flesh to death, we live. We find what is true life in Christ Jesus. And then He will glorify us. And verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. This is the revealing of the sons of God. The glory of God the Father, Jesus, He showed the glory of God the Father. Jesus says that, I have glorified you. He said, when people see me, they have seen the glory of the Father. If you see Jesus, you see what God the Father is like. Jesus was the image bearer, uh, like a mirror, and he's reflecting the fullness of the glory of God. That's your destiny, to reflect the glory of God. Amen. That people see you and go, oh, that's what God's like. Man, wouldn't that be awesome? Mm. Usually they see us and go, oh my goodness, that's what the devil's like. No. We have good days and bad days, amen? But the, the thing is, there is a glory, and, and the Apostle Paul was receiving revelation. He was not yet perfected. He even says that, I am not yet perfected. I am moving on towards the goal. I will not give up. I'm not yet perfected yet, but I'm pressing on. And I encourage you, press on. I'm not yet fully showing the fullness of the glory of God. That's the Apostle Paul speaking. 
But the Apostle Paul got a, a vision, a revelation of the glory. And he says here, when I look at my present sufferings, as I struggle against sin and self, as I struggle against the enemy, and I struggle against all the oppositions of the enemy, in the warfare and the suffering that I'm going through, I count it worthwhile. Mm-hmm. This is worth it. He says, it, it's not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed. When I think about the glory that's going to be revealed, I am willing to suffer this Amen. suffering because the glory is so much greater. Amen. And so you don't focus on the death of the cross. You've got to focus on the resurrection. Amen. You die and Jesus is raised in you. And if, you, if we always focus on what I have to lose and what I have to put to death and what I am not allowed to do anymore and, and um, what, I'm, you know, what God says um, is, is bad. And, and you know, if we focus on all of that stuff, we're only going to suffer and we'll suffer to the point of death. Yeah. Why? Because we're listening to the voice of the flesh. Yeah. But if we listen to the voice of the Father, we stop focusing on the suffering and we focus on the glory that is set before us. And you know what? It's worth it. It's worth it. 100% worth it. The creation, it says, the creation itself is waiting in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Wow. Wow. The very creation, this planet, the sea, the mountains, the atmosphere, the weather patterns, the animals, they're all waiting in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Who are the sons of God? We are. Now that's interesting. The sun, the moon, the stars. It says all of creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Meditate on that. The spiritual atmosphere, the natural atmosphere all around us, the angels, the demons are looking and waiting for something. Demons with fear and trembling that it will happen.